and everything else. And now our speaker, Tim Apno uh, from Red Hat, to talk yep. about future things. All right, great. Thank you. Woo. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming out and thank you DigitalOcean for setting up this place. Uh, it's always good to be in New York. Uh, I, I've been traveling a ton lately and it is nice to just try to use the subway. I use the word try because it's always a challenge, isn't it? But uh, it's great to be here. For those of you who don't know me, uh, Tim Apnell, I'm a senior product manager at Ansible. I am an all-around Ansible guy, meaning I started using Ansible around version 0.4 and shortly thereafter started making pull requests and, and contributions to Ansible itself then. Uh, when Ansible became a company, uh, I was one of their first customers. I was working at Bank of America here in New York. They use a lot of RHEL and fair bit of open source. So that was my, my jam, so to speak. And when I left Bank of America, I ended up joining Ansible, and then we got acquired by Red Hat, and now I'm with Red Hat, and now I'm with, I guess I'm with IBM. That hasn't sunk in yet. So, uh, so with that said, I'm going to be talking about Ansible, where it came from, where we're going with it, and some of the things that we're doing with it. Uh, this is going to be a multi-year project or, or initiative that we have going uh, with the product, talk about what it means to the user community, some of the changes that you'll see there, uh, and some of the things I've been working on personally as, as a product manager. So I have a bunch of things to show. Uh, I've tried to strip all the marketing and sales stuff out. I promise I know I understand what this group is. Uh, I'm not here for that. Uh, just uh, a little, I'd, I'd appreciate if everyone could hold the questions until the end. So I, I promise to Try not to be as long-winded as I am at this moment and get through all of this. Uh, and then you can ask all the questions you want. I'll be sticking around uh, for whatever, whatever you have in mind, OK? So uh, what I'm going to present, like I said, the future of where Ansible is going. Part of the reason we've, I've been out doing this, I've actually been presenting this a lot since uh, January earlier this year, is to talk about what we're seeing and where we're going to try to be as open and transparent as possible of what we're thinking and what we're seeing out there and why we're doing the things that we're doing. Like I said already, this is a multi-year effort that we're going to be going through and it's, we're going to have to take a lot of incremental moves along the way. And in doing so, you might wonder, like, why are they doing that? Why, why, what the, what, what's behind that change? What, what's behind that release? I'm going to try to give you some of that insider knowledge since I was involved in a lot of this. Uh, to, to, to give you that insight of where we're going. So as you see things happen, you have an understanding of why we're doing things and where we're going uh, with Ansible today. So with that said, um, let's see, I should start my timer. So I'm, ah, forget it. <laughs> uh, okay, with that said, uh, I'd like to, um, there we go, start off with, this is the first commit to Ansible that was made. Uh, I always like to start with setting some context of what Ansible is about, what, what principles have guided it, what philosophies are behind it. And I think that's really important because as we looked forward, we had to think about what made Ansible what it is so we didn't lose track of that as we evolved Ansible and as we moved forward. So like I said, I think this is a really good reminder and starting point. Another key th Okay. Another key thing is the philosophies that drive Ansible itself. This is something for all of you that are familiar with Ansible. How many people use Ansible now? Okay, good number, excellent, perfect. So you've, you've probably heard this before about, about Ansible's simple, powerful, and agentless. The idea of it being that you don't need programming skills, that it's, it's mostly declarative, and that the tasks are executed in order. But at the same time, it's abstracting you away from having to think about and worry about all the underlying details to to getting things done, uh, the, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, the desired state engine, for example, of figuring out, well, what state are you in and what do I need to do to get there? And the fact that it's been agentless has made it both simple and powerful. Uh, simple in that you don't have to worry about setting up and configuring and maintaining agents, but also it's made it powerful in that it's allowed us to uh, embrace a lot of different use cases that if we had agents, we would not have been able to do. So there's a lot of, you know, that's, that's one of the things that we're challenged with right now, the number of use cases for Ansible itself. I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
Okay. Another key tenant of Ansible itself was that it was designed to be modular from the very beginning days. This is an academic paper. It's, it's actually a pretty good read, at least half of it, and then it gets into some odd math that was over my head. Uh, but it, it, uh, a key part of Ansible was the fact that it was modular, that so many people could easily contribute to what it did and to get something back out of it. If they had a need, there was a way for them to extend Ansible easily to contribute that back to the community and to get usage out of that themselves. So it made for a very healthy ecosystem in terms of the code base than the, 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 the community itself. Sorry, that just... Well, it's skipping a slide on me here, and I'm not exactly sure why. Another key principle that I'm going to be talking about a lot here is the fact that Ansible was also based on the idea of batteries included. And this That's really bizarre. OK, this, I, I may have abandoned the remote clicker here. It's uh, not cooperating with me. OK, so thank you very much for that. Uh, so this is a key part of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, is the fact that it, uh, Ansible was based on the idea of batteries included, which was a key part of, of it was borrowed from Python, which Ansible's written in Python, so it, it you know, makes sense that, of course, we borrowed a lot of that culture and thinking. But the idea being that when you installed Ansible, you get a great deal of functionality right out of the box. You don't have to you know, pull in all these different modules and, and things like that to get it up and running. It was, you installed it, you had all this functionality, and we cover like all these categories here and then some, just to give you an idea. With the release of version 2.9, which is due out any day now, we're gonna have over 3,000 modules alone inside of the distribution of Ansible that goes out, just to give you an idea. Okay, much more reliable. If you didn't believe uh, uh, about the success and, the, and, and the, the things that we've been able to achieve as a community, as a group, these are just some vanity stats that we've put up, uh, that I've put up here. Uh, the Octoverse ranked us as number seven in terms of contributors. I know we were in the top 10 and a few other categories there. So out of 93 million projects sitting in GitHub, uh, we came in seventh. So that was... It was, well, it was, it, it was humbling, actually, to see, especially because we, we edged out Kubernetes. So our, op open, <laughs> our open shift team really loved that one. Probably won't last, but for, for the moment, we're going to gloat a little uh, over, over that one. But you know, we're, we're up over 14,000 forks. We have over 35,000 stars. The commits are, now I think it's actually more in the 45,000 range now that have happened to the code base. So it's been an incredibly active code base and it's had a tremendous number of, of participants in it. Um, but you know, that said, so for all these accomplishments uh, and, and, and the progress that we've made, we can't just sit back and say, yay, we won, we're the king of the world and go home at this point. We have to keep thinking about where are things going? Where, where are they going next? What can we do better? Uh, what, what can we do more of? Because the fact is, is if we do sit back at that point, progress is just going to stop if we just stop thinking about these things. Uh, little Easter egg, Thomas J. Watson was one of the former uh, IBM CEOs. I didn't pick it for that reason, but I realized it later that I would picked a quote from the CEO of IBM. So with that said, and all the progress, we've kind of uh, found ourselves being a victim of our own success when it comes to Ansible. We've been going through a tremendous amount of growing pains. The things that used to work in the early days when I was involved are starting to uh, strain and, and we're starting to see challenges in maintaining the project and keeping it going. One of the biggest problems that we've been faced with lately is that the, num the volume of the contributions that we are now getting to the Ansible code base is making it hard to <coughs> release Ansible itself. A uh, funny thing that uh, uh, we more recently, someone, very active member of the community kind of called us out in, uh, I think it was Twitter or in a blog post, that we don't care about our contributors because we don't, we're, we're slowing down our number of merges and, and pull requests that we're processing. And it used to take him a day, and now he's, his pull request has been sitting there for two months, and we haven't 
uh, processed it. And uh, our community manager actually ran some stats and found that we are actually merging pull requests faster than ever in the history of the project. The problem is, is that we are getting contributions in faster than even we are being able to process these pull requests. So it's causing a backlog to participation in that all, the, all these uh, pull requests are rolling in and our, our core committers are not able to process them fast enough to get them into the code base itself. So those are some two really big challenges that are happening in the community out there. Another thing that's happening, uh, particularly as Ansible is becoming more popular with ISVs out there and, and other vendors, is that we're having to deal with many different release cycles. With Ansible being uh, a, a batteries included distribution model, if a vendor misses the window for a release of Ansible, they're now having to wait four to six months for their new features to ship inside of Ansible uh, when the next release rolls around. This is becoming problematic, especially when you know, we have all these cloud providers and, and, and soft, uh, um, hardware provider, network providers, ISVs that are out there constantly making releases so that we, we're, we're having a problem with this release cadence that's out there. As I already mentioned, there's been dramatic expansion of the use cases over time. We have people that are using it for, for networking, people using it for security automation, people using it for, for Linux bare metal. Uh, there are actually people using it to automate Windows, cringe. Um, don't, don't, don't hate us for it, but they need help and we take pity on them. So we help them out. Uh, so, so there's all these different use cases that are going on out there that, that Ansible is being pulled in many different directions. And then the other thing that we're starting to see that's probably less apparent to everyone in the room unless uh, maybe you work for Red Hat or, or IBM uh, is that we have a number of projects and products teams outside of the Ansible team that are coming to us and saying they want to embed Ansible in their uh, project or product. Rather than build their own automation tool or means of automating what they're doing, they want to embed Ansible and, and have that be the way that you automate what they're doing. There's one particularly large company known for the color blue that's come knocking on our, on our product team's door quite a bit lately. So we're having to think about that. How do we, how do we embed Ansible automation in these projects and products? Okay, so what does all of this mean? Well, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. And I think this one really sums up what we're dealing with here as the, the, the Ansible team out there. Uh, you know, we're on this speeding car, zooming down the road, and we're trying to uh, change the tires uh, very precariously and not crash and burn in the process. That I think kind of sums up what we're looking at at this point in time when it comes to Ansible. So in, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess it was now almost two years ago, uh, a bunch of us were, were talking about all these different issues and, the, and, and you know, that, that I just had up on the screen. And uh, what do we do about them and where things are going? And you know, we, we had this whole thing. And it, and it occurred to us that uh, you know, one of the first things that came to us is really that Ansible was really evolving to become a platform. That it was no longer uh, going to live up to its potential or, or its end users' needs if we just continue to look at it as a couple of disparate tools that we happen to produce and that you could use. Uh, so this is not to say we're reinventing Ansible, but we see it as an evolution of where our end users and our customer base were already pushing us with Ansible itself. So this is going to require, we, we, you know, in, in, once we had realized that, we realized it was going to take a mind shift in how we approached the, the, the roadmap and the future development of Ansible out there. So that was a, a key first part. So at that point, once we said, okay, we're going to have a platform here, and what does that mean? Uh, it became apparent to us right away that we were going to need a few sane options to the batteries included model. Now, uh, I've presented this a few times, and people have gotten really upset about this because they thought we were abandoning batteries included. The, the key word is, is the options here. We're not uh, going to abandoned batteries included, but what we realize is we need to create a few uh, alternatives to how we've done distribution of content. Because for all intents and purposes, batteries included was the only way. And we have to have 
other ways in addition to batteries included. And I'll explain what that means, but this is a key part, and this is why I needed that batteries included slide up that I somehow messed up back there. Skipping over. So the proposal in making this happen is that we needed to separate out the core executable engine from the modules and the plugins and the docs. So that's the first thing that we needed to do in our mind shift. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But also, we needed to find ways of externalizing this content in a, in a way that was more fluid and more flexible to what we were looking at going forward to having this platform and to be able to address all these different use cases and, and, and release cadences and you know, remove these barriers to uh, participation. So with embracing the idea that, okay, we need to move Ansible towards being a platform, uh, we need to have these sane options to batteries included, and we're going to need to shift around how we manage our code base, we realize that that means that certain assumptions we've always been able to rely on in the way that Ansible has been developed, in the way it's been maintained, in the way that we've conducted ourselves with the community are going to need to be looked over again because they're going to change. Some of the ones that were quickly identified were managing namespace conflicts and incompatibilities. Since what was in the package, uh, Ansible itself, was what you had to work with, if someone brought in a module with the same name as another existing module, we were able to catch that and you know, fix that and say, hey, you need to rename that so that there isn't a conflict. So if someone wants to use A, you know, they don't end up with your B here. Well, that now starts going away. We also didn't have to worry about the initialization performance because everything sat in one space. We weren't like scanning the whole file system for content that was out there. Uh, quality control was handled by our own people and everything going into core and the tools that were testing the core before anything got merged in or, or as changes were happening. And we also didn't have to think about merge, uh, versioning because it was only what was in the develop branch that mattered to our developers at the time. So, you know, backwards compatibility and things like that, they were able to kind of play fast and loose with for that reason. So with these, uh, so in addition to these assumptions changing, that idea of moving to a platform and these, these alternatives to batteries included meant that we need to, uh, that well, it brings new requirements to what we were doing. And that's what I'm gonna go a little bit further into depth with here. This is a, a preview of some of those things. Uh, so the first thing that we said is, okay, if we're gonna have content that's going to be independent of the core engine itself and have its own release cadence and can come from outside of the uh, uh, Ansible itself or the engine, uh, we're gonna need a means of packaging and shipping this stuff around. I mean, you know, what else are we gonna do? So, uh, uh, so the first thing we did was we said, hey, let's take a look at Ansible roles. Uh, one, one of our developers threw in a little feature on the side one day that allowed you to put modules inside of your roles. So we said, okay, let's see if we can take that the whole way to be the thing that we use. And we uh, quickly realized that it was totally insufficient. Uh, one of our, one of our uh, uh, lead engineers and architect, he uh, started down a project of trying to torture test this idea. And he created a role called WTF Ansible. And he just tried to do the strangest things possible in trying to use a role as a means of pulling in external content. And he found all type of strange bugs and oddities and you know, corner cases and things. But the one that really killed it was the fact that there are plugin types that need to load early. So by the time a playbook was parsed and it saw a role was being called, it was too late for those plugins. So we immediately say, you know what, without significant changes, roles are not going to work. We might as well look at something else, doing something else in addition to or, or uh, as an alternative to roles. But we liked roles. We liked the way that they worked. We thought they were very consistent with the Ansible way, that they were simple, they were lightweight, they were easy for people to understand, and that they, whatever, if we created something similar, it would be easy for our users to follow along down this new path. One other thing we looked at, uh, it was a bit opportunistic, was we had often got this long-standing request for being able to bundle multiple roles together. 
there, there were some people out there, uh, you know, like Jeff Gearling. Anyone knows Gearling guy out there? He has like over 100 roles. There's, there's the DevOps team. They have 30 or 40. They, they would like to have a way of packaging multiple roles together. Today, you have to have a repo for each role. And that becomes tedious when you're like Jeff Gearling and you have 110 roles. And maybe 30 or 40 of them make sense being together in one bundle that someone could install. So what we came up with, something called Ansible Content Collections. And this is something that was announced at Ansible Fest a few weeks ago at Atlanta uh, that we've been working on. Uh, the idea of uh, uh, collections, as we just call it, is uh, uh, it's a new format of packaging multiple modules, plugins, uh, module utilities, uh, you know, things of that nature, or roles. I'm, I knew I was forgetting one thing. And it's actually created in a way that we believe we're going to be able to add other things. I know we've been discussing about docs, for example, being part of a collection. Um, the current release doesn't support that. I'm getting ahead of myself. But the idea is being that it's to, to streamline how contributors and, and partners are going to be able to create their own content and enable end users to be able to add, extend, and update Ansible itself with it. OK. So what I have up here is uh, exa an example of what a collection looks like on the file system here. For any of you, know, I know a lot of you are Ansible users, you're going to recognize this because it looks a lot like a, a typical Ansible project uh, that you might have. You have the roles directory, and in your roles directory, you can have multiple roles that are there. So in this case, we have a ping bootstrap and a ping deploy role in here. We also have a plugins directory, and so for each of the plugin types, you can have a subdirectory in it for that type. So in this case here, we have an action uh, plugin that's shipping in this collection. We also have the ability for you to bundle module utils, which are the libraries that can be shared across a plugin or a module, and the ability to also include multiple modules in this collection itself. The only thing that is a, a little bit unique to collections is the galaxy.yaml file. That's essentially like a manifest file, a metadata file, where you can put in, uh, you know, who created this, what's their email address, what is it licensed under, some, you know, things of that nature. It's very similar to the uh, met meta main file that you would find inside of a role, but applied to the entire collection itself. Okay. Who is using Ansible 2.8 right now? I've upgraded to the latest stable. Okay, only a few of you. Have, did you have to port anything when you moved to 2.8? Perfect, it worked. I have yet to find a person that had this problem. So we actually shipped a tech preview of collections in 2.8. And the whole idea uh, is that it shouldn't change the way Ansible works today now for any end user. What I'm showing you here on the screen are only if you're using the new features that we are adding, collection, you're, that you're accessing content from these collections. Otherwise, things should work the way they always have. And like I said, I've, I've given this presentation now over a dozen times, and I've yet to run into one person that had a problem. So we're, yay, it worked. Uh, so that said, moving on, I'm going to jump to the tech, uh, the task section. So one of, one of the things that we had to deal with was uh, na uh, namespaces. So we could uh, help end users manage partic uh, potential conflicts of content that is out there. So what we now have enabled is fully qualified namespace module calls. So in the first one there, we have Tima Ping or Ping. This is uh, a Ping module that exists in a collection called Pinger that's owned by the namespace Tima. So that will call that module in that collection only. We have two built-in pseudo collections, for lack of a better term, that are built into this depending on your usage. So we have the Ansible.built-in collection. This is when you want to access a module that is built into Ansible itself and only that module. So in that case, if we wanted to access the, mod, the ping module that always ships with Ansible, we would use that one. If we need to force the, uh, the way that Ansible has loaded modules, we would move to the Ansible.legacy one. So this goes through searching through certain paths and then going into what's built into Ansible itself. And then as I 
uh, through, through my questions, got, uh, you can just call module the way it is today. And you would get the ping module that you always expected and you shouldn't have to make any changes there. Now actually though, I'm lying a little bit because of the section on top where you see collections. With that and the ping module, what would actually happen, so the collection section came about after we did the initial development work around collections. Our engineers took a step back and they were working with a, um, with, with, with a test collection and uh, they were fully, having to fully qualify all their module calls to the same one collection that they were working with. And they're like, you know, this is getting really tedious and verbose. We need a better way to avoid this from happening. So they came up with the idea of this collection section at the top. This works like a, your, uh, the, the file search path on your system. So where you would list the collections that you're going to be using in your playbook. And when you call a module like ping, it'll look at the first collection on the list for that ping module. If it can't find it there, it moves to the next one until finally it'll look in Ansible itself. So this is a way to try to cut down on the amount of typing that you would have to do and uh, speed things up. Okay, trying to keep moving on here. Uh, so if we're gonna have this content, we're gonna have these collections, you're gonna need a way to manage it. This is some our engineers really wanted to avoid because they felt package management really makes things, can make things you know, complicated and messy. Uh, and we actually read a, an article, it's a really long article by a guy named Sam Boyer. He wrote about his experience writing a package manager for Golang and how it, it just, as, I forget exactly how he puts it, but he's like, he says, no one wakes up one morning and says, you know what, I don't have enough pain and suffering in my life, let me write a package manager. He <laughs> said, I mean, that's like the opening sentence of the whole piece, and when you print it out, it's like 60 pages. Um, but it, we, we read it, and uh, a number of us read it and have decided, you know, have, have talked over and argued and debated trying to cut down on this from, and to, so it would suck less. Uh, is the way that we, we went in and approached it. So uh, with that said, we said, okay, what do we have to work with? Okay, Ansible Galaxy, the command line tool, uh, well, it, it's not really a package management tool. A lot of people always thought it was, but it really wasn't. But let's give that a go and see if we can adapt it. And we realized, yeah, no, this isn't gonna work. And the other thing was that, going back to what I just said about making it suck less, we realized we're gonna need to experiment here and we don't wanna break the usage of Ansible Galaxy the way it exists today. So we forked it and uh, started, uh, uh, forked that part of the code out and started working on figuring out what is the best way to do this stuff. And I remember an early prototype we did was that every piece of content inside of a collection had its own individual version number. And I tell you, we have unlocked the eighth level of hell when we did that. <laughs> because the dependency tree and trying to figure out how to manage the dependencies was just, I thought my head was gonna explode. Some of us just screamed in terror and we just said, no, 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 we are not doing this. So collections have one version number for the entire collection. You change one thing in the collection, you have to increment the version for the entire collection. So we went towards a coarse grained um, and, um, approach trying to uh, emphasize simplicity over flexibility. So like I said, we're trying to make it suck less. Um, so anyway, back to this story. So, so we, we forked it into a project called Mazer. We did a lot of different of these experiments and tinkering and we reached the point where recently we were like, hey, we like what we have here. We're, we're gonna, th th this is good. And uh, engineers took a step back and go, oh yeah, I, I, I could merge that into Ansible Galaxy. So at this point with version 2.9, all the functionality that we figured out in the Mazer project is getting folded into the Ansible Galaxy tool itself. But now we feel much more confident about what we're putting in there and that it's, it's stable and what we want and what's gonna work best for us. So if you hear that Mazer thrown around, it was this experiment that now has being, been decommissioned and is going away. Okay, uh, so if we're gonna have a platform, we're gonna need new tools. We're gonna need development tools. We, we've been able to leverage a lot of the ones that Python itself has. We've created a few for the Ansible core itself. But if we're gonna have this external content, we're gonna need a way of supporting all of that work to automate it, to, to keep the quality up, to make testing of it easier. We already made some moves over a year ago. Uh, we, we adopted the Molecule project. That's a, a, 
a testing framework for roles and playbooks that the community had created. And we, uh, we talked to the maintainer, the guy that had created it, and he said, you know, I, I, I really don't have the time for this anymore. And so we said, great, we'll, we'll help maintain. We'll take it over. So um, that's now part uh, uh, un under the Ansible group in GitHub itself. Uh, we also have been putting a lot of time into the internal tool that we test core with, Ansible test. A lot of work has gone into that for version 2.9 that we're about to ship so that that tool can be applied to external content and collections. That was something that we didn't have before. That tool had assumed you're only testing the core engine itself. Now we're going to make it that those, that same, all those same tools, sanity tests, smell tests, all of those things that we run over the core can be applied to the code that someone writes for a collection. Another one we adopt is Ansible Lint. That's a static analyzer. It looks at your roles and playbooks and tells you if something's a little wonky or could be better, things of that nature, um, just to try to keep your style you know, honest, so to speak. OK. So as I, I talked about the early proposals, and this is really a work in progress. This is something that we haven't done. We're not going to be doing for a while, but we wanted to put out there of where we're going with this and what we're thinking. It's that we're going to need to uh, restructure the Ansible project itself, the code base, particularly the repo. And there's two different ways of looking at what we're doing and how all this stuff comes together. The, from a development perspective, we're going to be breaking out the Ansible code today that's in one repo into multiple different components. So you'll still have the repo that is the core engine itself. By the way, this means that we're probably going to definitely just plummet off of the Octoverse, but that's showbiz. Oh, well, that's not where we're in this. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to split out the, the, the core engine on its own. We'll then take out the modules and plugins into another repo and the, 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 that are the core ones. And the core ones we define as the ones that are most commonly used, the, 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 the package module, the copy module, the template module, all those ones that you can almost not avoid uh, you know, using when you're working with Ansible. And these are the ones that uh, the Red Hat engineers are very closely uh, scrutinizing, testing, and maintaining themselves uh, also. So that'll be in a separate repo. A third one will be all the community uh, modules and plugins that have come in from the community uh, where we, we as the team at, inside of Red Hat don't have the means or the knowledge to maintain or to test this stuff ourselves. So we're going to put that in the community and, and that way uh, the community can help take care of that stuff that they've already contributed to Ansible more effectively. And then the fourth thing, and this is something that's already started to happen, is we have a lot of ISVs that are really investing in Ansible. F5, for example, is a really good example. Uh, Microsoft Azure is another. They want to have and maintain their own collections of, of, of content that works with their offerings. So we'll, we'll see a number of these come out that are being uh, developed and maintained by these vendors that live away from the Ansible core engine. Okay, so that said, that was just though for the repo. So one of the things about Ansible that was uh, confusing to some people is that the repo equaled the package. Essentially, we had one repo and, it and we created one package from it. What's going to happen here is we're going to have multiple repos in a more complicated packaging process. And the reason being that from a, develop, uh, from a distribution perspective, we will still have this batteries included offering that'll pull all this content together from multiple repos into one thing. So from the end user experience, it should pretty much be the same. They can grab this one bundle of 3,000 plus modules and install it on their system and have everything that they were used to having in previous versions. The other distribution that we will be uh, creating is what we're calling an enterprise one. Uh, being a commercial business, we had customers, enterprises that said, I don't want anything on my machine that you Red Hat won't support. If you don't support it, don't give it to me. So the problem with the batteries included module for them or, or, or model for them was is that they were getting a lot of modules and things that, they, that weren't supported or that they didn't want on there. And uh, so we're creating a second bundle for that usage that will be out there. I guess the possibility remains that others could create their own distros for very specific use cases and things, and probably it'll happen in the embedded module. 
um, model, excuse me. Uh, but that's the two that we are shooting for somewhere down the line. I don't even have a timeline for it because I, it's that, I believe, far out in the future. Certainly not in this calendar year, probably well into next calendar year at the earliest, to be quite honest. Don't quote me, but like I said, I've been around Ansible enough that that's the feeling I'm getting. All right. Uh, this is a blog post on all that, that whole restructuring thing that Greg DeConisberg, our community manager, wrote. He was a lot more elegant than I just was. So if you want to read more, that's where you need to go. All right. Uh, a couple things. Eh, product development stuff. I'm going to skip that. <laughs> all right. Um, so moving right along. Uh, this is something that I've personally been working with. How many people here are working with Kubernetes in their job? Okay, almost as many as Ansible users here. So this is something where you can use your Ansible skills and bring them together with Kubernetes. Uh, it's something that our OpenShift team worked with us on and I've been out um, you know, talking about and thought I would throw in here since it is part of our, our future uh, where we're going with things. So, the idea being that, uh, so what, what this thing is, is that today, uh, it, well, it's to make the management and automation of what happens on your Kubernetes cluster uh, easier to do and take care of uh, using your Ansible skills that are out there and Ansible technology and, and, and really taking a, the Ansible philosophy to doing that. So this idea of an operator started with CoreOS, which was later acquired by, uh, by, by Red Hat itself. And the idea, the concept of an operator was to simplify the management of these complex Kubernetes applications. Kubernetes can do a lot of things. It brings a lot of power, a lot of automation, and you know, things to do, uh, do, do things at, at a cloud scale, web scale, cloud native. Um, but the thing is, is, it's really geared towards having things that are stateless. When you have a complex application that requires certain special handling, you're now on your own. And you have to either do things manually or, or, or hack stuff together. Operators was a way of creating a framework and a pattern that lets you manage these complex applications in a Kubernetes native way. So they encode the human operational knowledge that you need in order to manage these complex applications whether it's you know, the, the, the whole life cycle of patching, upgrading, recovering, uh, installing, all of those type of things, and to do that in a way that is very uh, uh, cloud native. Because if you don't have it, you end up being in this reactive mode of monitoring your application. Something happens, a human has to you know, jump in there, could take minutes, could take hours, may mean getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning to resolve whatever just happened on your, uh, your Kubernetes cluster. Where with an operator, you can encode that automation and it can react within seconds because it's running in the cluster itself in a Kubernetes native way and monitoring what's happening in Kubernetes and then reacting to the changes that are happening there to correct, take corrective action. So typically, these operators are uh, traditionally been written in Go programming language. So they required you not only to know Go, but you had to understand the internals of Kubernetes and, and the Kubernetes API and not do something that destabilizes your whole cluster. For example, you can um, mess up your owner references and you, you know, will collect garbage in, in Kubernetes until eventually your, your cluster goes south. It's like C++ all over again. Um, you, you can also do things like a denial of service attack on your API server. If you're pinging it too hard, checking, polling it, you can, you know, really, and, and you have a lot of operators running doing the same thing, you can really weigh down your system doing that. So w the idea that came to some of our engineers internally was, hey, what could we do to kind of uh, apply the Ansible philosophy to this and the Ansible skill set? So the idea of building an operator with Ansible, or the benefit of it, is that you can use your same Ansible skills, the tools, the whole ecosystem that's out there in order to do this stuff. So it's bringing the, the, the you know, a, a tool that you can use, that you're already using in your traditional IT automation, you can now bring to this cloud native automation. Also bringing the same lower barrier to entry idea of 
No programming skills required. You can iterate this a lot faster, develop this a lot faster, deploy this a lot faster. Another thing, and, and this, when I get to present this over the course of an hour, is that there's a lot of similarities to how Kubernetes works, to how Ansible works. They're both declarative state engines. They both use YAML. So there's a lot of similarities uh, how the two work that they, that they fit together really well. Some other benefits, you can use the templating inside of Ansible. That's something that Kubernetes, or at least the, the cube control tool most people use, doesn't have. So you can do things with multi-cluster management and, and um, uh, repeatable rollouts, things of that nature. And um, yeah, and there's a, there's a, okay, let me move on. So developing these things, I'm just getting ahead of myself a little bit, is pretty straightforward. There's the operator SDK, which you can install. I have it running here uh, that I used Homebrew for. But there's a lot of different ways to install the operator SDK. And this is an open source tool that we're in the process of now donating to the CNCF. The process has begun. It's going to take a little while, but that's where we're heading. So I just wanted to clarify, this is not a Red Hat proprietary tool or tied to OpenShift. This is any Kubernetes, and it's something that, that um, you know, is going to be free and open source. So built into it, native part of the operator SDK is the ability to do this type equals Ansible. So it will start off your project, but in this case, it will create a Ansible uh, project for you. So it sets up a role and all the things that you need for developing something with Ansible that point, you write your playbook, your role, whatever your automation is that you need to do on Kubernetes. Typically, it's using the Kates module that we ship that is essentially just like uh, cube control, very similar. And once you have that ready, you also need to define what's called a watches file. This is a really simple YAML file that maps what you want to watch on Kubernetes and what Ansible automation you're packaging when an event happens. So it's the group, group version kind to watch and then what playbook or what role to call when something happens on the cluster. So that's how we, you, we bring these two together. Once you're, you're ready, you do a build. All that does is it, it brings together all this different uh, content for you and takes the, the, the Ansible automation you wrote and puts it in a container that now you can deploy to uh, a repository or, or deploy to any Kubernetes cluster you have. Like I said, it's not tied to OpenShift. You don't have to install anything um, special ahead of time to your cluster itself. Um, the Kubernetes, only, you only really need a version that supports uh, custom resource types. Uh, and I think you have to go back pretty, pretty far to run into a version that doesn't support those. So it's uh, that point. Um, you're ready to go. So just a little breakdown. What's in the white box? That's the part that when you're developing an operator that you have to think about and worry about. With using the operator SDK and developing it in Ansible, you get all the stuff that's in the gray box there for free. So the way that we do all this is that there's an operator SDK binary that gets packaged in there for you that performs a lot of the magic, that does a lot of the abstraction and the heavy lifting. So that, like I said, it's doing the, the owner references and it's doing the, you know, to make sure garbage collection works and caching of API calls, things like that so that you don't have to think about and implement it yourself. And it brings in all the Python, Python libraries, Ansible itself, the Ansible runner. All that happens automatically during that build uh, command. So you don't only are we thinking about your Ansible automation and mapping it to the events inside of Kubernetes through the watch file. That was really skimming across the top of this. Um, anyway, just a little bit of fun as we were saying that uh, operators with Ansible makes Kubernetes sing. This is our the operable. We created a mascot for our little effort. Uh, if you like this guy, I got stickers, so please don't attack me at the end. Um, that's the only thing that will get you jumped faster is if you say you have free t-shirts. Uh, um, but anyway, come up uh, and, and I can tell you all about the making of the operable. So uh, yeah, so when are we getting all this stuff, uh, Tim? Uh, when are you going to stop talking about this? So this is a rough timeline. The fact is you already have some of it today. Like I said, we did a tech preview of collections already back in June when 2.8 shipped. Any day now, we're going to be shipping Ansible 2.9.
and that's going to include full support for collections. We feel like we've worked out the bugs and gotten a kind of a 1-0 of, of what collections need to be uh, worked into the system itself. Uh, that's going to then follow by if you're a, an AWX or tower user, there's going to be a release a couple weeks after engines roll out to work with that. Uh, then next spring, probably around the time of Red Hat Summit, we'll be rolling out Ansible 2.10 and a new version of Tower uh, that, 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 that all works with this stuff. We're going to be moving ahead with a lot of the, the features and certification, things like that. And then probably not pictured here in the fall, we'll do more around the development tools uh, again. We're looking at, and we don't have a date for, what is Ansible 3.0? We've started talking about, like, when do we declare something 3.0? What features go into 3.0? Which ones do we want to introduce when we declare um, in the release of Ansible 3.0? We haven't figured that one out yet to even what's in 3.0, so we don't even have a date for it yet. But just, in the, you know, for the sake of transparency, we are thinking about it. Uh, it's out there. The thought is out there. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. All right. Uh, this is just some resources. I'll be sending my slides along so you don't have to. But if, if you can't wait, quick, take a photo. Um, this is uh, some docs on developing collections using them. There's a guided demo that uh, our, our uh, engineering manager wrote. Some other things. Uh, that link from Greg DeConisberg again and, and actually a, a sample collection that you can find inside of Galaxy. Um, that was one of the other things that happened that wasn't pictured here is Galaxy already has support for collections today. If you create a collection and upload it, it knows what to do with it and how to catalog it differently than Galaxy works today uh, just on roles. Uh, operators, if you're interested in that, uh, there's getting really good getting started guide that is under the operator framework project out there. Uh, there's also a page on Ansible where we put some links to the, the latest material and things that are out there, uh, including things like the docs for, I got to find a better place for this, but the docs for the Ansible part is there. And then more recently, I did a webinar uh, of on operators or with Ansible for the CNCF. It, I demo a lot of what I talked about, and I went in more detail than what I was able to do here now. So if you're interested in that, you can watch the video. Uh, you'll probably recognize some of the slides, but not, not all of them. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, if you want to contribute, these are some of the other projects in addition to the main Ansible engine project. Uh, our engineers spend way too much time on Freenode uh, in various Ansible channels there, so you can talk to them directly. And then I have a couple resources if you're interested in operators and Ansible operators. Uh, the, the Kubernetes community uses that Slack system, and, and there is a Kubernetes operator channel there, and there's also a mailing list out there on, uh, on Google. So with that, uh, hopefully I didn't go too long. Yeah, maybe it could have been a little shorter. Uh, any questions? I know I threw a lot at everyone. And we have a microphone, sorry, just for everyone to hear. All right, I need water. Um, this is not important, but did the modules used to be bundled in a sub-module? There was a brief time <laughs> when we tried to separate all the modules out from engine itself. And uh, that did not work well for a number of different reasons. And we've already talked over how to avoid that this time around. Um, yeah, initially, to be honest with you, that was done as a knee-jerk reaction by the founder of the project because he was getting mad at filtering out the uh, bug, the, 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 the tickets relating to the engine from the ones relating to the modules. And everyone went home one night, and they came in the morning, and Michael had s s separated the two. And everyone was like, ugh. And then we were all like, tried to make it work for a year or so or two, and then finally said, you know, this isn't working, and merged it back together. Uh, but that said, with that hindsight, we're hoping to avoid most of the problems that that sporadic cut. So my real question. Yes, OK. Uh, so there used to be a project called, um, called Ansible Container. Yes. Oh, is it switched on? There used to be a 
Yes. Uh, the Ansible container. Yes. And yeah, I thought that was really handy. Yeah. Yeah, eh, nothing's ever gone in the open source world. Uh, you, you're, yes, you're right. Um, it's, it's something that we're still looking at. The, uh, it, it went dormant for a couple of different reasons. Uh, and most of it was resourcing uh, within Red Hat and not getting enough community contributors to it that it, it slowed down. But it is something. There are other similar projects that have... Uh, cropped up out of it. Uh, there's, uh, I, I, I honestly I have a problem with the name. It's called Ansible Bender. There's another project out, there. yeah. Um, uh, English wasn't their native language, so. Uh, there's another one called Ansible Builder because Red Hat's created all these uh, container tools that aren't tied to Docker. Uh, since the Ansible Container Project that they've come back and said, hey, whatever happened to Ansible Container? We'd like to have these tools use that. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's dead, and, but we're trying to decide where to go with it. So, yeah. Any, we have a question? Oh. Will 2.10 be the last release before 3.0? No, I don't think so. Will the 2x brand still continue to contain community content? That's a good question. I don't think we've, we've decided either. Uh, yeah. And then finally, for is community content defined? Uh, does that include ISV content? That will depend on the ISV. Uh, if the ISV wants to have their own repo, that it, uh, we will work with them to extract it out of the community stuff and put it into their own, their own collection that they're going to maintain and manage themselves. That's the plan right now. But if a vendor doesn't want to step up and it's not something that, that we as Red Hat feel confident supporting, then we will, um, then it will go into community. We, oh, sorry. So uh, you talk a lot about Ansible Galaxy and how it relates to collections and that kind of stuff. Um, my curiosity is, I'm guessing a fair amount of us in this room operate in fairly uh, restrictive um, environments, yeah. especially due to regulation. And that yeah. um, is there any story right now, uh, and forgive me if Bill Tower and ABX do this, but is there any story for internal distribution of collections uh, like there, there is something in the product roadmap for that. I shied away from it because it was product and not project, and I know where I'm at. Um, but to, to really, to quickly summarize, we announced something called the Automation Hub, uh, and that is a uh, that is a galaxy for the customers that need certified content. So there's a whole certified uh, collections program that we've started to work with these ISVs to test what is out there. So so a a so the post 1.0 there's going to be the ability to upload your own private content for your company that only the people within your company will be able to see and okay. use. So it, it's like a 1.2 uh, feature. So 1.0 is ready to ship in a few weeks and then there's like a 1.1 that has some other features and then 1.2 was like the ability to host your own. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. I think, yeah, we had one over here. I don't know if anyone else. Oh, the operators? Yeah. The operators are just using what Kubernetes tells it to, that when a state change happens, it calls what the, it, it calls the, or it tells the operator, or well, actually the operator sees the change happen and then knows to fire. What fires that is entirely up to you or the internals of Kubernetes. So it's, it's, there's no intelligence to the role 
Right. So if, well, the internals of Kubernetes, if a, if a pod dies, for example, or a node dies and all the pods have to be redeployed to pick that up, it's going to tell the operator so the operator can, op can do something with it. If something tells the Kubernetes API to scale up the number of replicas, that is going to tell an operator so that it can adjust itself to it, adjust your application to deal with having more replicas. So when you create these triggers, you can uh, prioritize them? Because otherwise, let's say you have some operation that's running and it crashes. And yeah. And then it restarts. It yeah. controls the restart. And then it crashes again. And before you know you have a race condition on your server, right? And then you have another priority, a higher prioritized trigger that says, I mean, that, that's something you could potentially build into your operator itself, I, I think. I haven't tried that. Uh, well, no, I mean, would Kubernetes do it itself? I mean, I, I, I don't think Kubernetes, Kubernetes would keep trying to reach the state you told it to until something tells it, no, that's not the state you want. Yeah. Any more questions? The fun part about a wide room is having to. OK, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'll be around if you were shy. And I also have uh, operable stickers. Mm -hmm. <laughs>